Hello and welcome to Real Talk with the Unicorn. My name is Tatiana. I'm a recruiter in supply chain and logistics. And today is our episode number 19. I'm very excited to introduce my today's guest, a very famous person in retail world, Gary Newbery, senior executive in supply chain, the last mile with retail aid. Gary is also someone who never stops learning. He's a certified supply chain management professional, and Gary was recognized as top 100 influencers in retail world. Gary, well, Welcome, welcome to the show. Yes, I can see the signs. I can see all the recognitions. Great. <laughs> welcome. I, I'm delighted to be here, Tatiana. I know that my network and your network don't overlap a lot. So I, I'm really super excited to be here and talk to the people that I often see going on to your other podcasts that you, you do. And there's a huge following you have. So uh, as I say, I'm delighted to be here and perhaps uh, impart some knowledge in some way uh, to those people. Yes, Gary, and I'm glad that my audience can also learn a lot from your expertise because I know people in my network, they either are from retail or they work with the retail account very closely. And I myself I had a few years in retail environment. And I want to ask you the very first question that I'm sure everybody wants to hear the answer to. Automatic replenishment systems, they oftentimes cause a lot of pain on both retail side and uh, vendor side. In fact, CPFR role was created to leverage that uh, stress and of course we see shortages overstock obsolete inventory transfers in between stores and the list can go on etc etc what are your thoughts around automatic replenishment systems what do you suggest to your clients when it comes to dealing with inventory at store level replenishment yeah i'm going to dodge the specific of your last piece of your question about store replenishment in detail I'm going to go over here slightly and, and just talk more broadly about auto replens and maybe we can dive back into that once, once I've gone through that. But I've worked with clients in the past who have placed enormous store and auto replens. And the fact that I've been invited to come along and help them suggests that the auto replen didn't actually work very well. And the, the truth of the matter is they tend not to work very well. Uh, and there are four or five steps that people have to go through and often it, there's such enthusiasm to switch the thing on because it's maybe a configurable element of a ERP system or production planning system or retail planning system. Oh, replan says, oh yeah, turn that one and see what happens. Mm -hmm. And that's the worst possible situation. And, and worse than that is we turn it on excitedly and we, we go and do something else. And the bet business reaps the <clears throat> benefits or chaos that, that arises from that. But the third thing that I would do in setting up an auto replay, a replenishment system which is automated, and we have to perhaps get our terminologies correctly on this, is the first one is that I would try and work out what types of behaviour each item within the inventory profile has. And that may end up with nine, 10, 20 groups, whatever it might be, and try and crush it down to about nine or 10, which is probably manageable. So you'd have things that are, must be always on the shelf or these things don't appear very often, you know, the strangers and the repeaters and all that. But we can give them labels to make them a bit more consumable by people outside the analysis. Mm -hmm. Once we have those classifications, we need to define very clearly what the inventory policies are for those types of behaviours. So often we might look at a product group and say, oh, they're all apparel or, you know, women's skirts or whatever it might be. Oh, they must all behave like this. So let's get on with it. Switch on that machine. Let's go. When actually we may find within even something which looks like they should be similar because they're all the physicality of them is they're very similar, but the behaviour is very different. So we need to define specific inventory management policy for each of those labels. Forget about the actual products themselves and just go for the labels. So we may have things like uh, very unsophisticated tools and techniques like min-max systems and two-bin systems or real-to-point systems, right through to double exponential smoothing and, and anything in between, which kind of helps you to be able to go back in history and say, if we applied this policy, this would encourage this type of behavior. Once we've got those things sorted out, we need to define algorithms that will deal with unusual demands. So it's easy to do with 
ordinary demand because that's implicit in both the behaviours and and also the inventory management policies that you're going to apply to these items. But we want to have algorithms to deal with the unusual things, like say in retail we run a particularly odd promotion. We may have ratio pack, may have a whole range of different things, or maybe a, an event which does cause a spike in one particular item or group of items. Mm -hmm. The fourth thing is to actually collaborate with our suppliers, to actually share this information with our supplier. This is how we're moving forward. This is how we classify these items of the whole assortment you give us. And these are the policies we're going to apply to those. So, you know, there may be a, a discussion about, oh, maybe if we work with you on this basis from a supplier, maybe we can give you 100 rather than 20s or something like that. So you have to work with the supplier in detail to build a trust because if you turn this machine on and you haven't told them, you will start to see what would be the ball would perfect in, in manifest itself pretty quickly. And the charges, charges can apply to those short shipments that supplier was not prepared for. And that's yeah, like, yeah, because it catches them on the hop. Mm -hmm. uh, and alongside that would be sharing the outcomes. As, as you imagine you're switching this auto replen system on, that you're sharing those outcomes and you can work together and say, well, that didn't quite work out, doesn't it? And this is the, the interesting thing about auto replen systems. It isn't turn it on, set it, up, down. You actually have to do almost a daily, if not weekly, review of how is it actually, get, is it not just the individual items, but the overall picture. Is it actually moving us forward? Is it filling our shelves better? Is it keeping our racks full? Whatever the criteria is. So they're the steps that we must work through before we switch a wretched thing on. Mm. But as I say, there's an awful temptation when somebody discovers we've got auto replay and they might do some initial analysis, but in the rush to sort of like, hey, look, turn it on and off we go. And we're into a, often a whole world of hurt. I, I went to a book wholesaler who they bought mm. and something like 32,000 SKUs. All, all with hugely different uh, mm. profiles in terms of their inventory behaviour. And we put a lot of store by auto replan, but the reason why I had been invited, but somehow we weren't given the service in our independent bookstores very well. I don't know what the reason behind this is. Well, try looking at the auto replan, turn that off and see what happens next. And guess what we did? And suddenly things started to improve pretty quickly. The auto replaying can actually handcuff a business to a certain way of thinking, which is no longer relevant. Mm -hmm. So unless you do all that hard work, work through that process, I think anybody who's got a, an auto replan system that's switched on and isn't delivering, you need to almost switch it off and go back to basics and, and really start to understand those five steps, which is define the inventory, in terms of classifications, work out the policies you're going to apply, define the algorithm for what happens when something out of the ordinary happens, uh, an increase in demand, a, a change in mix, whatever it might be, to work with the suppliers and then to monitor this, like insidiously monitor it like a crazy person to make sure it is actually delivering the benefits of what it should do. It, on, in theory, why wouldn't we do it auto replens? It takes out so much clutter. It yeah. takes out all that. Well, what should we do today? Oh, let's let's order five. Let's take all that out and just focus on the exceptions rather than the big firefighter go, well, I'm getting behind or oh, make that 10. Get on with it, kind of thing. So the auto replen is a great thing if it's properly conceived and worked through and everybody supports and we do those five steps. That's amazing. It also uh, indicates the need for uh, supply chain professionals who work in retail, continue learning new things, continue learning those um, fundamentals behind the replenishment logic to understand because categorizing inventory, those are the things that for some people are not that obvious. So definitely uh, the more complex our systems are, it means we need to invest in our development as well to maintain relationship with those systems and make sure they don't run us and we actually have a little bit of control over them. <laughs> I give an for instance, with, with a <clears throat> company that we both probably know that I recently worked with, they uh, deployed uh, E3. It don't matter what it's called. I think it was JD, it might be JBA or something like that. Uh, but it was their, their category management system. 
And what had happened over a period of time, and I, I don't think I'm talking out of term, is they had effectively an auto replaying system mm-hmm. in, in a fashion, but they made so many manual interventions, oh. it warranted them carrying on making manual interventions. So when we onboarded a big new retail client, all faith was placed in, oh, this will correct the forecasting errors that the client was actually making and force enough to bring in loads of stock into a warehouse that was not big enough to contain their wishes and aspirations. And they said, Gary, just wait six to eight weeks. E3 will sort it all out. I said, it won't. <laughs> because I'm at, on a different project, I actually mapped the processes and it was wow. these people going, oh, let's make it happen. The system was brilliant, but because so many people manually intervened, mm-hmm. it required everybody to manually intervene from there onwards to correct the errors of the previous interventions. So if you're going to have a system, do the hard work, get it up, make it work, press the button, turn it on, whatever it is, and monitor it. But don't go in and intervene on individuals. Say, this algorithm is wrong. We need to fix the algorithm. Go back to source, fix the algorithm, and monitor like crazy. Do not manually intervene. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. That's very important, Gary. I see how you are passionate about retail. And uh, recently, it's the last mile also that kicked in during COVID, especially. What other industries are you interested in? And because you have years of experience, what other industries you impacted with your expertise and improved? Yeah, it's a great question, because uh, if I actually said how many years I've been working, it would be probably, uh, <laughs> people would say, are you really? <laughs> But I've, uh, when I talk about retail supply chains, mm-hmm. it's not just retail. Uh, it's the whole consumer product spread of activity. So it's manufacturing. And I've been actually further down the chain or up the chain than that. But I normally describe the end-to-end retail supply chain as a manufacturer or CBG or FMCG if you're in Europe. But the three PLs, the, thing, the, 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 the trucking companies, the logistics companies that move things around between operations, wholesaling, retailing, and the last mile. That would be my construct of what I call, when I talk about retail supply chain, people often might just hear all the supply chain within a retailer. My view on life and my experience lends me to look at the whole flow of goods from where they're at least manufactured, if not sourced, if made. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm the thing before that, all the way through to when they're in the hands of a consumer or not that's at store or on their porch or they've driven up and had it put into their trunk. So you have a big picture understanding of lead time, expenses, who is involved, who needs to be involved or sometimes informed upfront about potential changes. Because especially with professionals who are very focused on retail, they tend to think of it as the main source of progress. Like, you know, if you change something on the retail side, it will change the experience for the customer. In fact, everything has to be communicated to all parties involved. You may not necessarily directly communicate with them. And uh, talking about inventory and all these new trends about big data, automatic uh, AI, what is it? (laughs) Well, to step back into your previous question, uh, because just just Uh, besides the industry I have been involved in, just to put some context on that, I've been around for Mm -hmm more than 30 years in the retail supply chain, end-to-end or extended retail supply chains. I've seen a number of big changes happen along the way there. I was involved going back a number of years. <laughs> I was involved in the last major outsource in the 80s of a specialty retailer, which was Storehouse, of its logistics to a third party, or bit that had a load of other third parties involved in the first place. To, and that was outsourced to XL Logistics or NFC as it was back then. And I've worked in uh, third-party logistics where, you know, the next company I worked at was the largest uh, or the fastest growing third-party logistics company in the UK. So it grew tenfold in three years. And then I did work for myself, working with lots of retailers, well, several retailers, lots of 3PLs, some wholesalers, many manufacturers. I worked in something like 40 different organisations doing 60 mission-critical assignments often as either a management consultant and bring brought in as an expert just to kind of understand what was going on and write a report and often helping them down that path. Or initially as a CFO, but uh, then 
uh, interim chief supply chain officer or interim CEO, chief executive officer, to bring about big change fast. Mm -hmm. So this is a great time for me because we're all going through disruption, but I think there's still some stuff to go through before people realise we have to change. Our yeah. business model, we have to change. And that's important to have people who have that appreciation of not just this industry, lots of it, but that whole the whole interaction of that flow of goods from where it's basically made all the way through to, let us say, porches or, or shop shelves. Yeah, that's true. And Gary, to, like right now, it's also the era of data. Retail has access to different consumer patterns, purchasing patterns. We get suggested things to buy. Like everything is about data right now. And I'm wondering, is this data helping business improvement processes? What are your thoughts around artificial intelligence, data accessibility yeah. to the user? I think data is... Uh a mid-organizational construct you'll find lots of people analysts and staff you know even heads of marketing might even get remotely interested in data but the people in the middle of an organization pour over data they, they cry for more data they, they want to put things together to come up with very uh, useful insights and people below them the workers they just assume that people have got data and improving things but the people above them have less data literacy they have like maybe they have the big picture or maybe they don't but they like to talk about ai and it, it, the ai plays to this idea that the higher up the organizations you go the more concepts you you are expected to understand and i think that ai is is a concept which carries a lot of how would say kudos oh, we've got AI going on. But the reality is when we get the box and we open it up and we got a desk as I say it and put it in, oh, we've got to fix our data. <laughs> but let me tell me that. They, they gave me the great demo and it looked brilliant. All these great things where you can get these meaningful insights. And I don't know how we're going to do that around here. Oh, just tell people we're doing AI, we'll be fine. <laughs> so the, the issue for me is AI absolutely has a position in business. The difficulty I have with this is data seems to be the domain of middles of organisations. Mm -hmm. It doesn't normally permeate the top, the echelons, the top echelons of organisations in a way that we might actually expect it to do, because surely... If we have data, we can be better informed, we can make better decisions, we can grow our, our mm -hmm. bottom lines and all that kind of stuff. But if there's data literacy at a, a senior level, there'd be an aversion towards anything coming up, saying that actually what you've been doing is for the last 20 years is a little bit defunct, we need to think this way. There's a huge, I think there's still a huge resistance of onboarding that, that kind of messaging. Yes, because there may be unexpected um, expenses, the bottom line. So it, I know it's all about saving money, but at the same time, when you implement something new and you try new things, you may also consider investing. And for those middle management, I find as a recruiter also is in supply chain, if you are able to work with data, you also should be able to interpret that data and present the story, present it in a sellable way to upper management in their language, in the language of profit yeah. and future um, market share so definitely uh, that's a pressure on middle management as well to promote so if we think about the supply chain it's, we're full of data how many did we pick what what parts you know, did we pick there's so much data in the supply chain world and we can absorb ourselves we back in the day people used to do their own spreadsheets and pour data into them and come up with things the reason why i, I, I sort of hold this view that it's a middle middle organizational thing that people in that level are obsessed with data if they can just have a bit more it would crack the code but if you imagine where supply chain sits within you know if you look at an average retail it's still merchandising and stores and maybe digital over here somewhere there's mm -hmm. been like the bastions of what we do around here and then supply chain is normally fragmented into tiny little silos and as long as it's working nobody bothers about it it's when it goes wrong like the ports impact on the west coast you know the Suez canal you know the, the whole shelf 
shortages or things that are visible. Oh, supply chain's not working. Where's our supply? We shout down from the, the C-suite to somebody in the operation. We do our supply chain down there, not with the supply chain persons actually on the C-suite saying, we've got this covered off, Gov. We have issues, we have obstacles, but we've got it covered. We, we've found a way through this. Because supply chain is quite data intensive and they're not sitting always at the top table, I think that we're, we're going to continue with big data and data crunch and data and analytic predictive uh, analysis is all going to be still stuck in the middle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Gary, everything that you are sharing seems to be very in, seems to be very intense in terms of change management, communication, and influencing people that may not formally report to you. You may be just an outside executive who wants to improve the business. Can you share maybe one or two? I'm sure you have dozens, if not hundreds, of those projects that you manage. Something that you are specifically proud of, or maybe something that can illustrate the complex of those skills that you possess. Can you share with um, us? I, when I came to Canada, and mm -hmm. I uh, started talking to everybody about Last Mile. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure I, I must have seemed like some kind of heretic because about 50% of the people that I spoke to said that I never catch on around here. And uh, I was a bit mystified why people should take that view. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the thing I obviously with the pandemic and people are confined to homes, it's become a glowing reality. But what I did with an organization which was the largest white glove, I mean, it was the last mile, but it was white gloves. So it was taking deliveries across a threshold into people's homes. Uh, we were doing between seven and a half and eight and a half thousand of these deliveries every day. So uh, there's no scale of that in Canada. Uh, and, and you'd have to go to the US to even get a sense of that scale. A, a couple of companies that were, back in the day, it was, I think, Pensy Direct and Home Direct, I had about 10,000 deliveries across the thresholds uh, mm -hmm. every day. So it was large. I, I ran an organization with 1,000 people. I was put in as an interim CO. Wow. It was unionized, 1,000 people, 300 groups daily, broadly, because that would shuffle around a bit. And when I arrived, the, uh, I mean, the starting figure is way above what we achieve in Canada. I inherited a, a very poor performance at 25, 26 calls per vehicle, so stops per vehicle. And uh, in six months, I've moved up to 40. So you can imagine a, a, the equivalent here is a, like a 20, probably 24, 26 footer, but a seven and a half ton truck mm -hmm. with 40 deliveries People, there's normally a two-person crew jumping out, mm -hmm. getting the stuff over the threshold into a room of choice. So it could be a telly, it could be a television, sorry, a chest of drawers and maybe a, a small fridge. That would be a delivery. So the average was 2.1 items per delivery. So moving that from 25 to 40 and also moving the service level from 80% in 10 days. So we would receive... Most of the deliveries were from Littlewoods, which is a sort of broadly had a history in mail order, but it opened up a series of stores. We, we did all of Amazon.co.uk, what we call heavy and uglies, Debenhams, House of Fraser, and a whole range of digital native brands. So they would come to us and we would shift about two and a half million deliveries a year. And they would come to us and go, We've got 5,000 beds. <laughs> Honestly, we used to lose their stuff. When I came, came to the organization, most of the management team um, then was just preoccupied by these small, relatively insignificant customers, which I had to clear out pretty quickly because we had to do a good job for Amazon, Littlewoods, House of Fraser, Debenhams, Marks and Spencers, Tesco's. Mm -hmm. Those were our prime bread and butter, so I had to do that. But one of the things that I became aware of pretty quickly was our approach to routing. Routes were, we would get the, the orders in, we had 28 days to deliver the Littlewoods orders and they would start kind of time window in the future. I said, well, why wouldn't we deliver here and here? Neighbourhoods, we're already there. <laughs> Move a truck 100 yards. Mm -hmm. So 
I had to change some of the parameters within our routine suite as such to, so that people could say, I know what we would normally do, you know, count, say, 10 days and then deliver. But if there's deliveries in this area, we're going to maximise our densities and not worry about, we used to do it this way. So I had to change that. There was also a number of things that mm-hmm. we would turn up at 7 o'clock in the morning because we had two delivery windows, 7 to 11, 11 to 2 or 3. Knock on the door, nobody would answer because we hadn't actually done the hard work of phoning them up. We've got a delivery for you tomorrow. It's on its way. And then potentially uh, take it off the route. But unfortunately, the way that we planned and the timing of this was that we would plan it, route it, we'd go and pick it, and you, you love this. They would take the consignment and put it into a warehouse and still keeping the consignment together. So, oh, got a fridge there. All right, put it over in the fridges. Uh, Tilly, right, Tilly over there. Oh, chest of drawers. Chest of drawers goes over there. This is, we're talking about a 250,000 square foot warehouse, which doesn't sound a lot in Canada, but I'm telling you this, in the UK, that's a big warehouse. And then they would pull it, run the order, and pull it out from me. <laughs> it's like, why? <laughs> it comes in as a consignment, and you split it out. You know? Why would and you so, tear it apart, right? It's like, and they're all individual orders, they, like, had all the address labels to that specific customer so besides that pulling them apart and were damaged and also we would often not get to the customer in time to say oh we're coming tomorrow at seven o'clock in the morning get up kind of thing we'd put it on a truck if we didn't catch it it would go out and if it was a first few deliveries can you imagine if you've got a vehicle jam-packed full of quite sensitive things heavy sensitive things that can get damaged really quickly we knock on the door, they're not there, I'll get the yellow card out, sorry, we came, phone this number for, to rebook your delivery. We'd, we'd already taken it off. We'd have to put it back on and we'd have to work around that for the rest of the 25, 30, 40 deliveries and sometimes we sent out with 60 on. And sometimes the router was putting the returns on first because it was on the loop. So go and collect some stuff on to, and try and find some way to put them onto a full vehicle. So there was a whole range of things I had to unravel. So I had to sort out when we approached the customer, how we routed. And on top of that, I had a union situation. So when I arrived, they had a failure to agree, which meant they were going on strike. <laughs> Just ahead of peak. It's like, are you serious? I've got to fix this problem. I mean, I can fix all these. These are technical things, but I have to fix this one. And so through fixing some of these other things, it allowed them to go out and actually land more stuff, which allowed them to earn more bonus. And they all became very happy and called off a strike. But I had a management team that was completely disempowered. So I had to re-engage them into a situation. And so what I set up was to actually have a effectively what we would call today a scrum meeting. So we'd meet at nine o'clock, we'd have a very fixed agenda and finish it by 9.30 regardless. And it was all about what did we do yesterday? What did we plan? What did we do? What are we doing today? What was our plan? How would we think we're doing it? And what's the plan for tomorrow? Mm-hmm. And, and what was the health and safety issues? Were any, because um, you're running a fleet of 300 vehicles, you're going to bump into you know, situations, uh, mm-hmm. you know, vehicle offence and stuff like that. And we had a few and we had, unfortunately, we had one death. Somebody just got into one of our boats and jumped off the top. And another situation was that they were playing football at three o'clock in the morning and somebody went on top of the warehouse to retrieve the ball and unfortunately fell to a, a pretty serious injury. So we had all these kind of things uh, in the background. But yeah, and going into peak, a peak which was projected to raise volume by 50%. Unfortunately, it didn't, but it didn't really matter because I'd been driving in the productivity to actually, ahead of peak, get rid of temporary drivers and, and de-hire short-term hired vehicles. And my client said, oh, should you be doing this, Gary? Have you haven't seen the peak? I said, yeah. <laughs> and he said, you've got a big grin on your face. Yeah, I said, have you seen the productivity? Have you seen how motivated my team is now? We, we can crush this. We can crush, for your double their um, demand, we can crush this. I've got the team, the team have now been empowered to know what to do and I've worked with them on the t- some of the technical things around routing and stuff so we can really crush this That's but very unfortunately cool. very over, over, over like this was just going into a, a credit crunch the, the, the great recession 
Mm-hmm. And so we'd all geared up for the peak and we'd crush the hoop, crush the peak, and the volumes would just went. And everyone's going, Did you miss some invoicing, Gary? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> and they were scratching it because I, I was looking after the two, two, the heavies and uglies, a two person business. And there was a carrier operation where just delivering to the porch. Their business had been slashed and nothing because people had actually turned off their, their e commerce buying habits because they were starting to be made redundant or laid off uh, as we went into the Great Recession. So it's kind of very interesting time. That's and, and that whole project took you said six, eight months, less than a year. That, that project, yeah, just less than a year. Yeah. So I went in to do an operational turnaround, and that, that means improving the performance of an organization in their market, which is still showing great prospects. Mm-hmm. I kind of exited with a strategic transformation, which is to lay out the plan mm-hmm. to completely reorganize this. So I went through, the plan was to go from three depots to one depot, Mm -hmm. um, basically somewhere close to Wrexham, where the major customer was, which was Letterwords. Strategical location, right? Yeah. And then also to piggyback on the back of the Mm -hmm. one one person delivery operation where we could just have, there'd be out out bases and and people would just come in to work there and, and do their delivery and collection routes. And then it would all be transferred back to, to Wrexham. Yeah, that's uh, also... So, but that, that, that in itself was a doubling of profitability. It, it would have cost them $12 million to, to execute that, to actually deal with the buildings and obviously some of the people who couldn't move. But also the, the re- return on that was like within a year, it, you start to make that, uh, that, uh, that improvement in, in profitability. Well, that's that's very that's impressive, and also your enthusiasm. It's it's really easy to give up uh, facing the first obstacles uh, in the change management aspect. I, uh, being passionate about something helps you go through those hard days and still share this enthusiasm with the team. Gary, what clients do you enjoy working with the most? Which type of clients give you freedom? Like what are you, what is the ideal environment for you to excel? I have to. <laughs> that on my on my website, which is going live soon, my role in life is to inspire business leaders, particularly in the retail or consumer products supply chain, to think big, be bold, scale, adapt, and win. And I, I don't say that lightly. I mean, it sounds like a great buzz phrase, but I that is my thing, and I, I've I've discovered this more recently that. I've worked with many different teams and I'm quite indifferent about the type of teams I'm working with. I'm currently working with a client uh, that we both know that is an excellent client. They're delightful to work with. They're entrepreneurial, slightly family business, but I put that to one side because I don't actually behave like that so much. They're quite organized. They're not like, oh, you know, it's my bro- brother and son and all this kind of stuff. They, they really are. Uh, delightful to work. They're action orientated. They're future focused. They're, they're in a hugely grown business. Their growth has been like sixty to eighty percent this year. It'll be the same next year. In a very uh, mundane industry, but you wouldn't see it from the enthusiasm they bring to to the bear every day. But I'm indifferent about what type of client I work with because I've worked in some incredibly toxic environments. But I'm always able to move, certainly the team I'm looking after, which would tend to be the supply chain, move them forward because I allow them to express their thoughts about, oh, we tried this three years ago, it it failed miserably. And I'd say, well, why did it fail miserably? Oh, this happening. I was, well, I'm here to help and make this work. Are you prepared to run down that route again with a little bit of extra support and push? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, let's do it. And suddenly, when people do the what has been the undoable in the past, mm-hmm. they suddenly build a huge amount of confidence. And I just stand back and let them get on with it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm indifferent about the type of client in terms of like their, their internal dynamic, their political dynamic, whatever you'd like to call it, the culture, we might call it. You know, Often the clients I've worked with back in England have been pretty broken businesses, broken spirits, mm-hmm. uh, often almost hopeless cases. And I've worked with a number of insolvent businesses and turned them around 
uh, and put them on the right path. And often that includes looking very critically at all aspects of the business. So if I'm in third-party logistics, and I've done quite a lot of work in this area, is to look at the customer base, look at the rate structures, look at the capabilities of what the company has and the, the type of capabilities the market is asking for from the current clients. And if necessary, chop the clients out to try and free them up to, to focus on the profitable segments. Mm-hmm. Look at the actual structure of either the transportation fleet and how they operate that, how they route it, how they, mm-hmm. how they execute, how they, if it's in a warehouse, look at the actual design of the building. What do they measure? Look at the structure, the, the, the type of storage media. Is it appropriate for what they're doing? If they're doing a lot of case picking, is APR, uh, adjustable pallet racking, is that appropriate? Did, should that be being done in a high bay, in a high, very narrow aisle environment, or should it have separate wide aisle? For, lots of things that businesses get built up over time. They get, say, if we're in a warehouse, people will say, oh, we need cantilever racking or adjustable pallet racking or continuous live feed systems. Life moves on, products move on, management moves on. And you go into a, an average warehouse and you look around and go, I bet this was designed 20 years ago. No wonder they're having problems because the things that they need to do now require different levels of capabilities, both in terms of the architecture, how the building's designed and what it's used for, in terms of the processes that they use. Are they formal, informal? Have they got SOPs? Do they relate to what we've got to be doing? The systems, often we find that when I was at that company, I was describing about the last mile home delivery network, we had systems from the ARC. I couldn't believe the stuff was pre-Y2K, so it dated before year 2000. And it was like, are we going to see the millennium bug? <laughs> Is it going to happen during my time here? <laughs> or do I kind of move on quickly before it spurts out? And then we have our culture. How do we do things around here? Not in terms of a process, but what do we value of things around here? And most importantly, and this is the key one, is what do we measure? And mm-hmm. then going back to your earlier point about data, we often measure things that are measurable, easy, because we collect all this data and we start, mm-hmm. you know, I've seen many times and I had a, a few great people in, in DFS who would take data and then do some <laughs> constructive formula and then some more on the top of that. And they give you an answer, you go, and you sort of think, what does it mean? You know, how do I change my behavior today to improve that? And it was not very clear, but it was a very sophisticated formula. Yeah, a lot of numbers. Those yeah, numbers but it was, it was irrelevant to the, the decisions that the, businesses need, the business needed to make today. But it was very good. <laughs> And actually speaking of today, we've been almost in like 15 months of lockdown on and off. What good things in your professional life or in general happened because of COVID? Like what would you be grateful for if you look back at this 2020, 2021? I see your enthusiasm, Gary. Thank you so much for uh, motivating us. You are uh, the person who motivates me as well. So I learned a lot from you and from your optimism. So what good things happened? Can you share with us, please? Yeah, there's whole ranges of things that happened during this time. And we can either sit on CP24 and watch the statistics every day and go, oh, this is terrible, and listen to the media messages, which I, I actually did. I skipped a year of TV, basically. I, I had no interest in this because if we understand, have a basic understanding of statistics, we would be questioning the fundamental basis of what we were collecting and, and, and the why, but putting that aside. Mm-hmm. I found the transition of some companies to a digital age should have happened you know, 2000, maybe 2007, when we had a smartphone appear and consumers became more empowered about the information they had. No longer did they have to go to the store because the product was scarce. It became very available on, on, the, on the smartphone and the information about it and, and things like social proof and stuff. So we lumbered through the next uh, 10, 15 years talking about digital transformation and about the last mile and click and collect and all these things. We've talked about incessant omni-channel, let's be omni-channel retailers and stuff. Mm-hmm. And let's, get, let's get to it. <laughs> it took the pandemic for many retailers to even say, oh, did, did somebody say we had to do it now? 
<laughs> well, for many companies, for many retailers, they had to do it now because their revenue went from, came off a cliff edge and went to zero. If you're a non-essential retailer, your revenue went to zero. The only way you could get out of this was to have an e-commerce presence, which could be executed by a consumer, could take orders, you could process those orders, and you, you could either kill yourself profitability-wise by doing it all from the warehouse, or you could use the stock to actually field customers' orders from somewhere where they'd be, they'd be prepared to do at least their last mile. You still have to do the selection, but at least the stock wasn't moving. So this was, this was a good thing for retailers to say, you have to act and you have to act fast. No longer can you ponder on things and just kind of talk about it for a little while and see how it goes. And, and you actually, actually had, to, had to do, I mean, retailers are great at executing things. They're highly tactical, generally speaking. So this should be, all oh, right, now they've learned this, they can learn other things. But what they haven't learned is the extension of their store footprint into the digital age by click and collect and, and mm -hmm. let's call it home delivery. So uh, on all those online services is only one little speck of a full digital transformation. So if they think they've arrived, it's a like, headline. You haven't, you just started. Mm -hmm. You should have started in at least 2007. Maybe the Great Recession might have triggered you to think of this is a good thing to do. So those organisations which were already progressing on their digital transformation will have stood a better chance through this time. Those ones who had to rush at it, the small independents, say, would have to jump onto Spotify and just hope that that gave them the, uh, the way forward to be able to at least deal with curbside. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, home delivery might have been still a stretch. Yes, of course. From other points of view, the, the transition of us as individuals from always driving down the 401, wherever it might be, into work, spent wasting an hour and a half getting there, maybe two hours on the way back, actually moving and migrating to working from home with its own challenges and all the let's call it commentary, I don't know if there's too much re actual research, but all the commentary has said that we're actually more productive, although we may have had to <laughs> educate little Tommy and <laughs> little Jane and stuff like that, but people are very adaptive and that they, they learn to perhaps cope with that and, uh, and the transition to online learning probably been a great help to them. I think this whole move to remote working, work from home, is actually a good thing because it it's broken that paradigm is you have to be at your desk from nine till five or mm -hmm. in certain environments from eight till seven to, to prove your worth here. So people uh, became more adaptable to technology. They've had to use real technology as opposed to, uh, how do I do that? Oh, thanks very much. Uh, do a little bit of technology and carry on with the rest of the job, which might be more physical than technology driven. But they have also been able to modify their work patterns to better balance their workflow. And I think that we're going to find that during this, when we come to the end of this lockdown period and emerge from this somehow, is that we'll have a more independent minded bunch of employees. And for employers, they have to now start thinking, how do we retain these people? And, and that's probably not really top of their mind and hasn't been top of their mind for a long time because they, many of the people in HR may have come from the Great Recession where they put the most simplest of ad out there for shop work or a person that works on the production line or, you know, supervisor or whatever. And they get 500 replies back and they're still living in that paradigm that they can get anybody who they want. Well, suddenly, me as an individual, I can work in lots of different countries now. I don't have to work in Toronto. I'd like to work in Toronto. But I, I can work in any place in the world now because I'm connected. I can do work remotely. I've been working remotely with, even with GFS. I, I pretty much work remotely for the best part of five and a half years. So people will learn from this time to say they can work independently. They don't need the boss sitting on top of them going, oh, you know, and justifying their own existence by micromanaging uh, those, those people and say, oh, 
if I didn't micromanage them, they, they'd be very unproductive. But I think that we, as a mature, in terms of maturity, I think we've moved beyond that. And that has big implication for the whole ranges of like urban design. And, and when you bring it down to a company level to what do we need to do around here anymore? How do we still have that piece of thing that brings people together at the water cooler? But maybe it's not the water cooler. It's still, it may actually have migrated to Zoom. Many people say that we, we just don't have that interaction, that cross-functional stuff. Well, we didn't have it in the first place. I think it's somewhat delusional. And there's clearly exceptions to this. I think it's delusional thinking that if your company run on the basis of random interactions at the water cooler, to be successful, I think you need to think again about your business model. That's a great point, Gary. I'm really glad that you bring up that uh, leadership part as well, because retaining independent individuals, retaining smart people who are visionary and keeping them multi motivated is a huge challenge for leadership that has to be influential rather than control, power, fear-based. Yes. I enjoyed our conversation. I learned a lot that is applicable to even my business. And of course, it reminded me of my days in retail. Gary, thank you for your expertise. I know you have a bunch of arrangements today coming up. So thank you for your time. It was amazing. And thank you for all the work that you do, all the influence that you have on people in either retail or other industries, but certainly those who are passionate about supply chain and growth. Thank you for having me along here but, uh, and having some really interesting conversations. And uh, I'm always best when I'm thinking out loud. It's not always, I don't always come up with palatable answers, but I, I am quite happy to, to think aloud and, and sometimes say quite bold statements that may move organisations forward, whereas before they were not open to such thinking. Yeah, that's, that's so thank you ever so much for the opportunity, Titania. My pleasure.